there was a government inquiry after the bushfires which said that there was a possibility that koalas could go extinct in the world completely by 2050 in, in um, New South Wales. I mean, it is, um, it's, koalas are only found in four, four or five states anyway, and New South Wales is one of the most significant states where koalas are found. So it, 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 that's um, really a very severe impact, and it shows that we need to take um, strong conservation measures now. <laughs>
dinosaurs and birds and how birds, modern birds really are kind of living dinosaurs. So it was nice that I could kind of bring my um, science journalism career kind of full circle back to my uh, education at the Natural History Museum in London. There's, I mean, that that really ties to to evolution. So, you know, I, I've, I've heard said that uh, that Tyrannosaurus rex and, and the many different type of uh, T-rex type of close relatives had some form of feathers or uh, mm -hmm. on them as well. And, and that they are closely tied to, you know, these flying dinosaurs. And you, you mentioned, um, uh, you know, that 55 million years ago when the asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula, it wasn't a full extinction. It was kind of, there was this evolution somehow that happened with transition into the flying birds that we have today that have a lot of uh, similarities. How, how did that, was that something that you learned in, in your academic view or is that something through these studies in the museum that just kind of came out? Um, I, I think um, the first feather dinosaur fossil was discovered in, in, in about 1996, but a lot of paleontologists before that point realised that birds and dinosaurs were very closely related. But, but in the past 25 years since that first feather dinosaur was found, I mean, there, there have been about 100 feather dinosaurs found, and many, many of them in China, most of them in China, but, but um, dinosaurs with direct evidence of, of feathers have been found all over the world. And um, so, I, you know, I'd, I'd been covering for years stories on some of these um, exciting dinosaur discoveries. And um, I covered a big feature kind of all, all about um, the new feather stuff. And that was what motivated me to write the book. But um, I mean, I think people realize now that modern birds actually are dinosaurs. And, um, you know, chickens are actually more closely related to a T Rex than a T Rex is to um, a. Stegosaurus or a Triceratops. So, so birds absolutely are kind of nested within the carnivorous dinosaur family. And so prior to that, the asteroid um, hitting the Earth 66 million years ago, there, there would have been uh, ecosystems were filled with dinosaurs and birds that were kind of living together in the same environment. And, and in fact, the majority of birds were sent extinct um, when the asteroid hit the Earth, but a small number of them survived and they they flourished and um, you know be, became the 10,000 or so living species of bird that we have alive today but they, they were it was only a very small amount of um, bird diversity that existed uh, uh, that survived um, that mass extinction event and, and interestingly there's a research showing now that most of the birds that made it past that extinction event were were ground dwelling birds because when the asteroid hit the earth there were global wildfires, all of the forests and trees were gone. So in fact, most of the tree living birds that were um, contemporaries of the dinosaurs didn't, didn't make it. And all of our um, living birds are kind of descendants of what were ground living birds at the time of the dinosaurs. I love that. I, I love that you express that. Do you, um, the, 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 there's a lot of evolution that occurs with those birds that, that kind of were ground dwelling birds uh, already, and then they maybe kind of even evolve more into what we know and see today? Or do you think that's just a, continue, a, a very slow evolution that happened or not totally different? Well, I, no, I think probably after the asteroid hit, there were, you know, there were um, a limited number of mammals and birds and other animals that made it through, but then there was a huge burst of evolution afterwards and they you know mammals particularly a lot of them were kind of um small fairly uniform looking um mammals at the time and they uh, mammals as well burst into all of the different kind of you know the the um the whales the anteaters the monkeys the the deers and cows and horses and so they you know there, there really was a burst of evolution off after that mass extinction event and the same thing happened with birds and all of them you know from from a fairly small number of ground dwelling birds, all of the um, birds that live in trees and spend a lot of time on the wing flying in every different kind of bird burst out of um, this group. So yeah, there was certainly a, kind of some exciting evolution going on directly after that mass extinction event. The, uh, the reason I kind of ask you on this and we'll, we'll, well, I'm, I'm leading you down a, a journey that we'll have today in our discussions that, that there's uh, some strong ties to evolution. There's some strong ties to mass extinctions or extinctions. Obviously, your new book that we're discussing today is 
flames of extinction, and uh, it's around the brush fires and uh, occurred in Australia. And um, we'll get definitely more into that. I, I speak to a lot of uh, authors and, and people who are evolutionary biologists and have to do with a lot with biology. One of them is uh, Matthias Glaubrecht. He wrote this huge thick book that you wow. see here. It's called the end, the end of Evolution. And he's only tickled the surface. I mean, he'd, I think it's a thousand pages, 700 of actual pages, well-written. I uh, even got a prize for it, but um, it just tickling the surface of, of evolution. He also works a lot with natural history museums, museums in not just London, but in Berlin and Hamburg and, and that. And a, a lot of that has to do with these old fossils, these old uh, uh, remains of dinosaurs and other, other species that are, that are around. And um, because of the title, of, of uh, flames of extinction, we have heard that we're in the Anthropocene, that we could be facing the sixth mass extinction. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the real kind of journey that you've been on, not only with, with your books prior and your academic world, and then what you've seen in your journalism, especially with those brush fires, then the pandemic hits, your book actually, released uh, uh, April 15th, so not too long ago, a little bit prior to that in, in Australia um, for the rest of the world. And uh, so congratulations during a hard time pandemic and after all this to, to, to be able to release a, a wonderful book during that Thank time, you. which tells us a lot of things. But did any of that wisdom, any of that research provide you with some learning lessons or some more resilience of how well, what the, not only the future of humanity is, but how maybe you know, we can do some things differently or need to do things differently to weather hard times of brush fires, climate change, human extinctions, biodiversity loss, on and on, that prove to be models that, that we need to be aware of or have on our radar for the future. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> they, they fossil record and what we know about the biological and geological history of Australia um, certainly informs um, how well we understand about what, what happened in the, the 2019 to 2020 bushfire crisis really was very unusual and absolutely um, unprecedented in Australia because um, Australia is really um, unusual among the continents in the world. It's the driest um, inhabited continent after Antarctica. And um, it, Australia actually, at, at the time of the dinosaurs, it was attached to um, Antarctica and a number of other continents as the super, southern supercontinent of Gondwana. And um, about 80 million years ago, the last two pieces of Gondwana, which were Antarctica and Australia, separated from one another, and Australia began to drift uh, northwards towards the equator and, um, so, and we still have remnant forests from Gondwana right down the east rainforests from Gondwana right down the east coast of Australia so there are many species that, that would have been trees that were around during the time of the dinosaurs and, and many of the trees that we have down the coast of Australia um, would have grown all over Antarctica as well so, so we, they're, they're called this kind of an, um, Antarctic relic um, rainforest that we have growing in Australia and uh, but what happened is as, as Australia moved north um, it moved into a, a um, climatic zone of the planet um, where it became increasingly drier and um, as it became drier and hotter um, bushfires wildfires became, began to become much more common and so animals and plants in Australia are very well adapted and have evolved for a long time to live in an environment that has frequent fire in it. So it means that many of the trees in, in Australia are eucalypts, the gum trees, we have about 800 species of gum trees and they grow in all different environments all over Australia. And um, those and, and um, melaleucas or tea trees and, um, and a few other uh, different Australian groups of plants are all um, very well adapted to dry conditions and fires. They have uh, they often have quite dry, leathery leaves that are very um, um, prevent desiccation. So they're quite water resistant. But but also gum trees, the leaves are full of oil, and um, they, I mean they're actually 
um, they've evolved to kind of burst into flames when, when fire comes through. And, and at the same time as having trees, which over evolutionary time have become adapted to fires, many of the animals in Australia have, have also grown in, have also evolved in environments that frequently have fire and ha have um, evolved responses to that. But, but what happened here in the 2019 to 2020 bushfire crisis, the, the fires um, were so enormous in extent, both geographically and temporally. They, 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 um, we just had fires to a degree that we've never had um, in so many different parts of Australia simultaneously. Certainly in, in modern history, but, but the um, fossil record, the geological record would suggest not really in, um, in you know, potentially millions of years before this in, in, in Australia. And um, this, certainly the past has informed what was incredibly unusual about the geographic and spatial extent of the, um, the uh, geographic, spatial, temporal extent of the bushfire crisis in 2019. 2020 and, and the fact that many plants and animals have evolved to live in an environment with fire but the fires were so intense and so far reaching um, for, you know for a number of reasons that many plants that are normally adapted to fire are, are not surviving with with the fires of the extent that we've seen it in particularly there are many plants in Australia that can they survive well in an environment when a fire passes through every 20 or 30 years um, so there, the, you know, there, there are many different kinds of forest types and ecotones in Australia, and some have fire more frequently than others. And there's kind of a mosaic of different ecosystems that are adapted to the frequency of fire in a particular place. But there, you know, there are many places uh, in Australia that were burnt in the bushfire crisis that might normally only have a fire once every 30 years, but they've had five fires pass through in the last 20 years. So even plants and animals that are kind of exquisitely adapted to environments that experience fire are really struggling at the moment. And it's actually something that we're seeing in other parts of the world. I mean, in California, the ponderosa pine and the animals that, that live in those environments equally are adapted to a certain frequency of fire. But as fires become greater in extent and are passing through more frequently, these species are going to survive. But in all of these places, what we know about the kind of biological and geological history of these environments is informing how we understand the degree of um, damage but also to what degree um, what is happening with these wildfires and bushfires is very unusual at the moment. Thank you for kind of going into that. Do you think that there are any learning lessons? So throughout your book you 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 take us kind of on this journey through different parts of Australia and you you talk about koalas and you talk about firehawks, you you talk about nightcap oak, you talk about uh, um, the lemur um, platypus, uh, uh, you go on and I don't wanna kind of give the cliff notes or give away too many uh, uh, nuggets of wisdom from your book and, and, and give it away because I want people to buy it, but were there some stark learning lessons of a better operating system that we can deal with, deal with this for more intense fires in the future, more climate change, uh, some things that we need to change what we're doing in order to be better prepared or to minimize that in the future? Can you kind of give us that uh, if there was any kind of real aha moments in there? Yeah, definitely. I, I would say that the, I mean, the the, the bushfire crisis here. I mean, normally, um, we have bushfire crises fairly regularly in Australia. You know, every every maybe every four or five years, um, up until now, there there've been um, serious fires that have caused a lot of damage in a particular region of Australia. But you know, like I was saying with the geographical spread, what was very unusual during a bushfire crisis was that. Um, you know, normally a bushfire crisis in Australia is called Ash Wednesday or Black Friday. And, and the fires this time, they, they began in August. They began sort of up the coast of North South, or New South Wales is on the eastern coast of Australia. So they began sort of in August, which is our winter, like halfway up the eastern seaboard of Australia. And then really we had um, rolling bushfires right down the coast through New South Wales into Victoria and then um, Can Kangaroo Island as well in South Australia. And so the, the fires this time, they spanned more than six months. And really, so instead of being called 
Black Friday. Was it, it's actually come to be called Black Summer here in Australia because the fires went on for such a very long time. So, and, and it wasn't just the geographic extent, it was also the um, incredible severity of the fires. And uh, I mean, to come back to your question about um, lessons we learned, I just wanted to set a little bit of the background here. But, it, but the, the other thing that, that was allowing these fires to kind of spread over such an incredible um, extent this time was that we'd had a bad, bad drought in Australia for about three. We We'd had at least three years of drought in southeast Australia before the fires. And it meant that in many environments, the moisture had just been sucked out of those environments. And um, so, you know, many lush rainforest environments up, up the, in northern New South Wales but and some of the kind of wettest places in Australia were um, so dry that they were made available to burn in these fires. And um, I mean, there, even, there were marshes burning and, um, you know, many places that, that we would never expect to burn were, were available to burn because of how dry the environment was and also because i mean this happens every year now in australia but climate records tumble almost every year but it was also because of the extreme heat and the heat waves that combination of a whole you know a number of heat waves climate records tumbling and and this terrible drought just just meant that these environments were very dry and very hot and the fires could just spread much further than ever before and i say that was a wake-up call because People in Australia, you know, modern history in Australia, there is no record of fires that um, went for so long, covered such an incredible extent um, of land and environment. And so really that was a wake up call for people and people were not, um, even though the government here had been warned, particularly by fire chiefs, kind of for six months or a year before that. And, and indeed in, um, you know, climate reports that had been prepared for the government 10 years before that were predicting large fires in 2020 but certainly the wider public were not expecting fires of, of the extent that we saw um in 2019 2020 and um you know i think many people were not expecting climate impacts like this to be happening for the next decade or two in australia so it, it caught many people really really unawares and unprepared and i, I so i think one of the main lessons um from the bushfire season is if we want to save important species and ecosystems in Australia then we need to think very hard about how we're going to be prepared for next time this comes around. I mean this summer in Australia um, we flipped to a different climatic um, system called the um, La Nina weather system and, and that brings uh, a lot of rain across the Pacific Ocean to Australia and so in fact we've had almost no bushfires of note in southeastern Australia this summer and it's um, it's been raining all very consistently across the summer. Everything looks very kind of green and lush at the moment. But we have to think about what's going to be happening in 10 years time because fires of the kind that we saw this year, next time, you know, Australia has rolling periodic droughts, but what's happening with climate change now is the droughts are slowly getting worse and worse each time they happen. And when they do roll around again, the temperatures are getting higher and higher. And um, so there's almost no question that, you know, it might be five years, it might be 10, it might be 20, but mega fires of the kind that we saw over Black Summer are definitely coming back to Australia. And we need to think very hard now about um, some of the things we can do to save wildlife. So, you know, kind of carving fire breaks around important environments, thinking about ways that we can get into these environments and um, perhaps fire, have firefighting efforts. There were some animals um, and plants this in that fire season where um, National Park staff firefighters were able to get into you know, an environment where an important tree was called the Wallamai Pine and, and um, irrigate that environment and make it moist so that when the fire passed through it was only low intensity or they were able to go out and kind of ahead of the fires rescue some insurance populations of animals so that if their environments were completely destroyed then there might be captive breeding populations. So we need to think very carefully now about all of the endangered and critically endangered species that are in places that are likely to be hit badly by fires in the future and, and, um, and think also about whether um, the legislation needs to change in Australia and if kind of our firefighting efforts at the moment can, um, you know, at the moment firefighting in Australia is very much built around saving human lives and property, but it, but in some of the states in Australia, the laws have been changed 
and and biodiversity assets and wildlife can now um, come under the directives when when um, firefighting efforts happen. It means firefighting government money and firefighting resources can be put towards um, rescuing animals or, or preventing fires from entering important environments. So it's kind of many of those things that need to be thought about now. And also, mm -hmm. I mean, there are probably many plants and animals that need to have um, need to be captive bred now, need to have insurance populations in case they're, they're lost in the world when these kind of fires come around again in the future. Boy, there's so much <clears throat> to unpack there. I, I think the direction I want to go, so when you were talking about the Wallamy Pines, that was in a, a different form of new conservation, extreme conservation that yeah. we're seeing. That was in your chapter seven of the book. And just unbelievable, um, the types of uh, new extreme conservation methods that we're having to, to take to kind of mitigate and prepare for, for these new things that are happening. I, I must say, uh, I, I wanna go on a more uh, global level for a minute, kind of step back and take a cosmic or overview of uh, uh, perspective of things and have you give me some of your, what you learned or what, what you saw. Um, the pandemic, basically in, in Europe, in the United States, so little was heard about the brush fires. We saw some pictures of koalas. We saw some kangaroos and, and, and you know, some devastating things for a, a blink of a moment, it seemed like. And then uh, pandemic and other things just seemed to wash that away. And I, I wanna know, did the pandemic or still, did it hurt what happened to, to kind of spread the awareness of, of not only for Australia, but for the rest of the world to kind of say, hey, we need to uh, not only have mitigation, but some more plans in place to be prepared for things like this in the future. Um, uh, also to raise awareness of what, what can be done and more conservation efforts and, and support for not just conservation, but firefighters and others, some, put some plans into place, but on a, but on a global level, um, the reason why I say this, and I, I kind of also, do you believe that that biodiversity loss, that those fires and the emissions coming from those fires that were spread just in Australia, that, that they just remained in Australia? Or do you think that eventually those emissions and that biodiversity loss and all that effect, or whether it's greenhouse gases or just the regular wind streams didn't, is affecting our whole planet in some respect for not, if it's just not more warming, but also other biodiversity and other forms of loss that we will experience in the long term. Um, I guess the first part of your question was kind of a, about whether the um, pandemic had kind of overshadowed the bushfire crisis. And um, yeah, I would. Um, well, I, I guess I'd start by saying, you know, if some of your listeners are not really aware of what um, how bad the bushfires were in Australia, like the total area was bur bur that was burnt was kind of bigger than Guatemala or Ireland. So, I mean, there were very large fires in the boreal forest, so in Siberia and Alaska. But probably these were the largest ever fires in areas where there's much um, human habitation. I mean, the, the wildfires in the west of the US were very bad this year but I, I think the fires in Australia probably burnt sort of three or four times the total area that was was burnt in the west of the US so um, you, we, we really had um, you know barely any cause to think in Australia that the fires were only really um, extinguished in around February March and of course the um, pandemic was already kicking in and I think most people thought oh a year in Australia really couldn't get worse after the bushfire crisis but um, yeah, of course, the, the um, pandemic ended up happening. And I mean, it had a direct effect on um, conservation and ecological survey and recovery work after the fires because we went into lockdown in mid-March. Um, and many, many scientists, um, conservationists, hadn't even been able to get out to places to survey animals because in a lot of the areas, um, once trees had burnt, it made it unsafe to go into these national parks. You could only drive down a lot of roads um, once the kind of clearing crews had been through. So um, it, the, the lockdown, the pandemic really retarded a lot of that basic survey work just to go out and, and um, try to find plants and animals. 
and see how how bad the damage had been. And that, thankfully, in in Australia, um, was not in all of Australia, but in uh, New South Wales, the state where I live. And, and many Australian states um, outbreaks were brought under control and, and lockdowns. Most of the lockdowns lifted here in kind of May, June last year. So men later in the year, scientists were able to go out again and get, get into these environments. But it was an unfortunate series of events that there's a very serious bushfire crisis was followed immediately by the pandemic. And I, and I would also say, um, yeah, people have had a lot of other crap to deal with this year and they um the bushfire crisis has is certainly something that probably hasn't been on, on a lot of people's minds especially because we've had a much wetter summer this year and we haven't had a lot of bad bushfires of note so um yeah the pan pandemic has overshadowed and drawn people's attention away but many um you know many scientists conservationists national park staff um people in government environment departments haven't forgotten about what's happened this summer this past summer and um, they've certainly been thinking about what, what we need to do in the future to protect stuff you know to help stuff recover now and to protect stuff uh, next time the issue comes around so and I think the second part of your question was kind of talking can I say that. something before yeah. you answer the second part of the question so uh, I'm almost certain that at least 85 percent of the population of the earth is kind of up in the dark of what occurred and see so you have some wonderful data on the ground experience in your different chapters not only about the species and the trees and and the fires and things i, I want to touch upon that for a minute and just make it clear before you answer the next question um it, it's almost a new epoch of, of forest fires brush fires that that were experienced and uh, to put it into perspective it's worse than an atomic bomb. It's between 650 million and 1.2 billion tons of CO2 that were emitted during that period of those brush fires. Um, that's just a CO2, okay? CO2, you can't see, you can't smell it really in, in, in many respects. So, uh, um, but to put that into perspective, but 530 million tons is the annual normal emission of CO2 or uh, greenhouse gas emissions from Australia in an entire yeah. year, 530 yeah. million tons roughly. And, and uh, so it, just during that shorter period of, of the brush fires, it kind of blew, blew right through that uh, annual emissions and kind of uh, uh, more than doubled. Uh, that, that's one thing. Secondly, just in, in, in one month, uh, due to fires, there was 19 million hectares were lost uh, in one month. One lightning strike in the Blue Mountains, uh, a World Heritage Site, burnt 85,000 hectares in one month. Um, three billion, three billion wild animals, animal species were affected. Mm. Seven billion tree species. I didn't oh, even oh, know three, there was... Three, um... Three billion individual animals. Individual animals, yeah. And seven billion tree species. I didn't even know there were seven billion tree species. Unbelievable. Uh, I think it said seven billion individual trees. So, yeah. so three billion oh, animals. Seven billion, seven billion trees. Seven yeah. billion in individual uh, 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 trees and three billion individual animals. You know, that's unfathomable. That's a huge number. Um, and I, I want I, I want it to be said, you know, I want people to understand that's 300 times the size of the United Kingdom, isn't it? That, that's a lot of size. That's a lot of space. That's a lot of uh, species or not species, but trees. That's a lot of animals. We need to really put that into perspective. And so having said that, I think there's a bigger impact globally yeah, okay. Uh, I don't, uh, even though Australia's a continent in and of itself, I think those those effects on the ground, but also those emissions play a bigger role in, in, in our global ecosphere, our, our biosphere, our cryosphere, our atmosphere, and uh, that that there are some, some ripple effects that we see that. No blame on Australia. Um, there's no blame anywhere for a brush fire, so to say, I guess. There are a lot of things that we could be doing differently around the world, 
to do that. But I, I guess now I'd want to, now that we've kind of hit the point home, either you say maybe a little bit more about that big impact, but I, I would now like you to answer that, you know, the, the next question of what you think for the rest of the globe. Um, well, we, we know that um, during those, uh, I mean, that majority of that sort of five, 600 million tons of CO2 was, I mean, that was probably really just released over December and January when, when the fires, with most of that would have been um, released over that period when the fires were at their worst extent. And, it, and in fact, we know for a fact the plumes of smoke from the, the fires were so great in, in extent that the plumes of smoke um, drift, they swirled around the planet, they swirled out uh, to the east of Australia across the uh, Pacific and the Tasman Sea down so they passed over New Zealand. There was, um, you know, um, ash from the bushfires was, ash and soot from the bushfires was falling in, in uh, rain and snow in, in New Zealand and colouring glaciers and um, it passed across the Pacific Ocean. I mean, there's NASA, NASA satellite images of the smoke plumes passing from Australia across the New Zealand and the Pacific to Chile and South America. And then, you know, within a number of weeks, um, you know, there were records of the smoke basically passing all the way around the planet. So you, you can see photos of the smoke plumes passing out across the Pacific. I mean, and it's not hard to see. I mean, they're, they're um, you know, they're clear smoke plumes in, in these satellite images that are passing right around the planet. So it, it sort of showed um, how, how severe that impact was of the smoke and, and of course here in Sydney with the fires in the Blue Mountains I mean for nearly all of December um, it, there was just a cons constant thick smoke hanging in the air and people were really you know it was time of the year when we'd normally be spending a lot of time at the beach but, it, but the sky was black and red it was unpleasant being outside people were wearing masks and uh, but then of course the, it was similar to the scenes seen in sort of San Francisco and other cities in the west of the US when, when the wildfires uh, came, were well, very bad and that came around last summer. So I guess I think the bigger issue here is that um, climate change is causing um, increasing drought, increasing heat waves all around the world. And the, you know, it, Australia was kind of the first example of these really terrible Mega fires, but there, there have been bad fires in many, you know, in the in the Amazon rainforest and in Indonesia, in the in the Arctic, in Alaska and Siberia and, and the west of the U.S. And wildfires really is as a result of the warming and drying of the climate caused by climate change are getting worse. That's so true. I do a lot with NASA and uh, do a lot with di digital ecosystem for the Earth for the United Nations. And satellite data, and especially what we've seen with uh, Elon Musk and Blue Origin from Jeff Bezos and many others kind of shooting satellites and, and uh, new Starlink broadband into outer space to monitor our planet and give us new broadband. We're getting this data. We're able to see that the burning fires of uh, uh, brush fires of Australia are not just enclosed in the walls there that they're spreading around the world they're uh you know leaving some kind of resonance and, and we also know that there's there's a big tie to air pollution and issues not just in global warming and greenhouse gas emissions but in air pollution which comes from fires and other uh, uh greenhouse gas emissions in, in our air that you know is just unhealthy for our planet in general um I, I just think that there are some some kind of bigger learning lessons from this, and um, I haven't heard enough people talking about it or uh, concern about new conservation or mitigation efforts. What do we do in the future? We know they're going to come. You say there's these rolling times and periods when the fires will come. There's these rolling periods and times of natural occurring droughts or hot seasons that that occur naturally. Uh, but they tend to get worse. And so what are the true methods to put these astronomical numbers, you know, the billions we've talked about, the millions into perspective so that we have a better operating system or a better plan to be prepared in the future? Now, I I've zoomed out. I've given you this, this big question from this global perspective, but you were there, boots on the ground. You went to all these locations. And the first of your book, you have this map of Australia, and it shows as you 
made your journey as much as possible around to see what was going on. And I, I really want to get these learning lessons, help us put that into perspective, help us understand what to do with this information in, in some respects, because I think it's so vital to know and how we can help, what we can do with concern, how can we apply it to where we live, um, many other things. So uh, that's kind of a broad question, but I, I want yeah. you to go with it because you, you were there right. on the ground. I think, um, you know, I, I said earlier that the bushfire crisis really, really was a wake up call in Australia. And um, I mean, Australia already um, is a place that has extreme climates, you know, much, much of the inland of Australia, um, you know, so dry and hot um, during the summer months that it's uninhabitable. And, you know, 80% of Australia's population actually live within 50 kilometres of the close coastline. So, we, you know, most Australians live on this little tiny green fringe right around the uh, outside of the continent. And um, I, I think the bushfire crisis really kind of brought home for people that already we're in a precarious position here, here in Australia. And it's not gonna take very much for, for it to become so hot and dry here that it's um, pushing the limits of where it's possible for you know, people, large numbers of people to live and people to live in cities. There's certainly been many studies saying, you know, if, if we continue um, going the way we're going in, in climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, that, you know, climate change is not mitigated, greenhouse gas emissions don't come down, then in, you know, 50 to 100 years, large parts of Australia where people live at the moment are going to be largely uninhabitable. I mean, in, in summer, you, you already in Sydney, during our heat waves, um, there, there are perils to human human life now if, if people don't have air conditioning. So, um, you know, are we? There, there are people certainly wondering now if, if we're heading towards a point where places that are, you know, beautiful, much cherished parts of Australia are going to be uninhabitable at some point in the future. It's, it's definitely something people are worrying about. And, um, you know, I would agree that um, unfortunately, because of um, the terrible effects of the pandemic this year, people um, have stopped caring so much about climate change and stop worrying so much about it. But I, but I think a lot of the, you know, what has been called doomsday scenarios that um, climate scientists have been presenting for some time. I mean, what, what happened in Australia this summer told us that, you know, some of these nightmare scenarios really could come, come true in the future. And, and the, when you look at the number of people, you know, the proportion of the population in Australia that believes in climate change and, and also um, had the environment as one of their top concerns, those numbers really increased from um, after, uh, you know, sorry, from before to after the bushfire crisis. And, um, you know, we, we had a government in Australia that were, um, you know, we, many of the members of the government might have been from a more climate denying position before the fires, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly been an, an important factor in kind of re removing some of that resistance to the idea of climate change and the problem of climate change in Australia. So, you know, I hope that once we're in a better position with the pand pandemic, then people can um, really start to focus a lot more on, on the problem of climate change. And I know, you know, when people ask me what, what they can do here in Australia, I always say one of the most important things is, is voting for politicians support strong action against um, greenhouse gases and mitigating climate change. That's really one of the best things we can do to secure our future and secure our environments here in Australia. And indeed, anyone can secure their, their future and their environments wherever they are in the world. I used to have a, um, an uncle who lived in, in Australia. I've been uh, there several times. I have family in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and Absolutely love it and uh, love the environment, but it's uh, one that not a pe not many people are aware of of what Australia and New Zealand offer. What 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 what's there besides this great biodiversity and you know great uh, place to live and be, and how how farming is. I've had several um, authors and and farmers on the show from Australia, um, and. Uh, it's 
amazing that we don't know certain places of our earth, uh, what, what it's like to be there. I, I want you to maybe give me just an example, and then I want to kind of touch on, on some things um, that even if we're tourists and have visited Australia before that we might not know. Um, so it's very hot. It's it's arid type of environment. Does that does that mean that there's it's a very dry air, or is it when you're outside you're just sweating to death because there's a lot of humidity in the air? Yeah, I mean, it, there's a whole range of different climates and environments in Australia. I mean, uh, uh, the continent of Australia is about the same size as the 50 contiguous um, states of the US. So, you know, same, not, we don't have um, quite the cold climate extremes that the US has, but we, we certainly have a whole range of, you know, mountain alpine environments. There are rainforests all down the coast. The, the entire top half of Australia around the coastline, it, the top half is tropical. And nearer to the coastline, the there are rainforests, mangroves, very green environments. But, but, but a lot of the very centre of Australia is more of that environment that people might um, kind of typically conjure up when they think of Australia, which is the you know very dry, red soils, sparse, scrubby vegetation, kangaroos. Um, but but it, yeah, it really varies place to place. I mean, a, a lot of the eastern coast and sort of Sydney, where I live, is subtropical, so actually it's often very humid here. But certainly in the city, you know, once you get kind of a hundred or a hundred, a couple of hundred kilometers or miles inland from the coast, then things start to become very dry and the air becomes dry. But the coastal fringe of Australia is is um, often quite kind of moist in a lot of places, and we do have a lot of rainforest pockets as well. There, and, and there fact, I guess um, yeah. a lot of people might imagine Sydney to be kind of very dry and arid, but in fact Sydney is a very green city, and you know, the, the streets are uh, filled with kind of um, um, prehistoric to kind of tropical looking trees and, and eucalypts. And if you fly into Sydney from the area, you know, the first time I flew into Sydney, I was really staggered at how, how unexpectedly green it looks from the air. Uh, in, the, in the UN for the past few years, there's been a lot of discussion about geoengineering and, and what we could do to to uh, kind of mitigate climate change. And uh, in in Jordan, there's been some pretty big water projects. Uh, uh, how do we use an old Tesla, um, Nikolai Tesla invention where we positively ionize the particles, the dust, the dirt, get it up into the air and do some form of cloud seeding to kind of get that moisture to rain, to, to bring it back down to, uh, to the watershed and the cycle. Uh, of life and, and change change our environments a little bit to uh, to do crazy things. Um, this coastal whole coastal thinking or, or way of living, uh, as we've seen worldwide globally, those people who live in coastal areas are usually ones one of the first to be hit by climate change in one way or the other. Uh, rising sea levels or hurricanes or or, or other issues. Uh, Australia's probably position better not to feel it as much but just this last uh, December we had the big um, uh, hurricane that hit Fiji and a bunch of issues there that uh, I actually did a telethon for them uh, Fiji Samoa Tonga they were kind of hit hard by climate change they're very obviously island coastal um, so there's so much that we need to be thinking about and doing on a political or government, uh, uh, putting systems in place to kind of change things. But I, I want to put a couple things into place. So those who have gone to uh, Australia or New Zealand for visit or tourism, um, I just want you to know, 2014 in your book, there was a study that... Um, Koala tourism, just koala tourism for Australia was a $3.2 billion annually uh, business, tourism business, just to go see koalas. And during these fires uh, in 2016, they did an estimated that there's roughly 329,000 koalas in Australia. Um, 
but a lot of those were affected in, in, in the fire. So a lot of them, uh, uh, as we said, the species, the, not the species, the individual animals that perished because of the fires. And in your book, you, you outline the chapters so nicely. You kind of, each chapter has a, kind of an animal attached to it as well. You know, koalas is, uh, is how the book starts out, the fire hawks in, in chapter two. And then you go to, the nightcap oak, a tree, uh, uh, lima rod, ringtail, possums, you know, then you go into the uh, regent honey eater and on and on, platypus. It, it's just a, a fabulous journey of, of animals that I haven't really had the fortune and ability always to see or understand or know. But with these fires, with this climate change, what we're seeing, and, and you just talk about this in the book, is... Uh, some of these animals dwell in the trees or eat from the ground or have have these different ways of living now that their habitat's been destroyed or the fires is drawing them down from the trees where they're more vulnerable by mm -hmm. other species to be attacked to be eaten to not find enough food or water etc and um, there's some some interesting things that have emerged with that where I guess it's, I don't know if you would call it evolution, but it's a different form of cultural change that is kind of occurring quick where I, I can't remember if you said it was the hawk, the fire hawk, or, or um, there's a couple others that really, that's the areas they go to where there's a fire and it's drawn out the little, pe the mm -hmm. little animals and rodents that they can eat. That some interesting things that have come. Can you tell us a little bit about the changes and the things that you're seeing when that occurs and how it changes the ecosystems? Well, there's, I mean, the, the fire, there's three different species of um, kite and hawk uh, in northern Australia that have been seen. Um, I mean, it, it, already there it was known to be something which has been called pyrex carnivory by um, scientists in the US and so, so um, birds of prey have, for a long time have been known to wait around the edges of wildfires and bushfires because they've learned that um, you know lizards, uh, small rodents, insects will, will be fleeing from the fire and it's, it's, it's a great place to kind of easily pick up your lunch if there are all these uh, yeah kind of um, plethora of animals fleeing fleeing from the fire so but, but there are a number of species in Australia that seem to have learned to actually spread fire themselves so they'll fly in and pick up a, a burning sticks and twigs carry them somewhere else and drop them to create a new fire and flush animals out, out of those regions so I mean that, that's um I guess I had that in the book as an example of the way that many plants and animals are adapted to live in a world of fire in, in, in Australia. And uh, so that wasn't so much in the regions that were hit kind of very badly by the bushfires this year. And, it, and it's only really, been, I, Aboriginal people have known about birds doing this for probably for thousands or tens of thousands of years. And there are many um, Aboriginal dream time stories and tales that kind of um, involve stories about birds and fire. So it's probably been something that's been going on for quite a long time, but it's only been kind of documented by Western scientists in the, in the last five years. So, I mean, it's possible that it happens in, in other parts of the world, but it's been recognized here. But um, I mean, just to go to that other point, you were talking about the impacts on koalas and um, yeah, you're right. The population estimates for koalas, you know, the mid range for that population estimate is about 330. And the, the estimate for the number of koalas killed in the bushfires is kind of about 60 or 70,000. So that, that's, um, that's a huge proportion of the species. That, and it gives you a flavor of the impact and terrible extent of the fires. And then really, you have to think that there were many plants and animals in Australia that were that are endangered or critically endangered that uh, only exist kind of as a hundred or a couple of hundred individuals so that you know there are certainly um, koalas have been incredibly badly impacted but there are certainly many other more endangered species that that could have been um, that may already have been pushed to extinction by by the fires and they've been um, you know, surveys are happening much more now. And there was a survey a few months ago showing that about 230 species of invertebrates, so in, insects, worms, snails, other 
creepy crawlies, but about 230 species probably need to be added to um, endangered species list now. So that you know, there's certainly been very bad um, impacts on wildlife. And with the koala, they, in, here in the state of New South Wales, where Sydney is, there was a government inquiry after the bushfires, which said that there was a possibility that koalas could go extinct in the world completely by 2050 in in um, New South Wales. I mean, as as Koalas are only found in four, four or five states anywhere. New South Wales is one of the most significant states where koalas are found. So it, 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 that's um, really a very severe impact. And it shows that we need to take um, strong conservation measures now. And, and koala, the koalas, like you said, they're, um, they're very famous. They're a sort of charismatic flagship species that draws people's um, attention but there are many other plants and animals in in australia you know hundreds and hundreds that could have also been very badly impacted by the fires but but don't draw any uh, anywhere near as much um attention or, or funding but koalas are a good kind of flagship or keystone species if, if we can try to protect koalas and save some of the environments where koalas are found and we're probably protecting and saving a lot of other species that are found in those environments alongside koalas as well there are some interesting things that I learned about koalas from your book that um, uh, some I knew, but uh, others I didn't know. Um, uh, I do farming, or I come from six generations of farmers here in Germany, but uh, I know with other um, farm animals and, and some issues with, especially from Europe, and have been been in Australia before that there's big issues around chlamydia uh, and heat movements to the coast, which causes problems for koalas and other animals and species that move into these more populated civilized areas, um, as well as just when they come down from the trees, which is the gum trees, where the, which is their source of food, that um, they don't do very, they don't fare very well on the ground against cars and dogs and, and other things um, that, that there's some really interesting learnings there. W when you talk to most people in, in Europe or in the, especially the United States, they're like chlamydia, that's a, that's a sexually transmitted disease. What, it, what does that have to do with, with ko koalas and that? I've heard that quite a bit that people don't even know that. Um, and it really, if I'm right, it occurred kind of from the European uh, farmers or migrants coming to Australia, kind of bringing that was in. was brought in with farm animals originally, uh, yeah, with, animals. with Europe. I mean, Europeans brought many diseases and problems to Australia, but yeah, I, I believe um, chlamydia was brought in with farm animals. But it's endemic, and so I mean, some koala populations, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland, um, so nearly every animal. In the population has it and it and it will kill them so a lot of conservation work with koalas is kind of treat you know bringing them into care and treating them with antibiotics and then sort of returning them to the wild again but it, yeah i mean even before the bushfires there were big problems with um chlamydia um car strikes and dog attacks really that have been um you know shrinking populations driving the extinction of local populations of, of koalas in queensland and new south wales and um they were regarded, the koalas in Queensland, um, the Australian capital the territory where Canberra our capital is, and uh, New South Wales, Queensland and, and Canberra had been regarded as vulnerable before the fires, and, but they're currently um, being considered to um, be upgraded to endangered following the fires. And I mean, that's specifically as a result of the fires, but they weren't doing very well before the fires came along anyway. Um. I guess the, the, the last uh, giveaway that I'll, uh, I guess, uh, for my listeners that I'll give on your book is, you know, they're, um, I'm big on farming and plants and gardening and things. The, the tallest flowering plant in the world on earth is uh, in the mountain ash area. Uh, uh, and it's uh, just beautiful. There's some really, some really beautiful biodiversity loss and plants and animals that we're just losing through things like the brush fires that uh, is just so terribly sad to see occurring in our world. And um, I see that throughout your book, you, you, you bring up, you kind of give us this nice connection, the story about how it is, what the 
what the on ground look and feel is during this crazy time that, that you experience and the the stories of like you have bear the dog who's in the book which is hopefully he's not bad against koalas he's more trained for for a good reason james a firefighter and and these different koala rescue uh areas that are reaching uh, raising monies for kind of sanctuaries and help around uh, koalas um i uh, I honestly suggest that people get this book, uh, even though there's some eye-opening things you're like, how can this be? How can we have lived through this time and not know that that these uh, things were going on? Because as, as the book says, it's flames of extinction. And uh, really, uh, I, I hope it doesn't become a mass extinction, but we really need to, uh, realize what kind of things are being lost every minute of the day every month of, of our our year and where it is and realize what effects that has on, on our world are there any things that i'm leaving out in the book that you would like to tease or let someone know about why they should read it and look at it and 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 what will it bring yeah, to I, them well you know I, you've um, obviously had a look through the book in some detail and yeah I'm, I'm glad that you kind of enjoyed the different species and, and animals that i sort of used as a way to kind of draw people into the different topics in, in a more friendly way but the, the other thing that i tried hard to do with the book was you know there's um a lot of very sort of depressing statistics and sad stories about what happened over the summer but i really wanted to try and find um people's more hopeful stories as well you know to bring a more um, positive and hopeful note and just show that it's it's not too late and there is stuff that we can do if we want to um you know prevent the worst excesses of climate change and, and save some of these really beautiful and important species and there are many people out there in in australia wildlife carers and rescuers conservationists ecologists aboriginal rangers park rangers who are just absolutely dedicated and you know are out there every day of the week doing everything they can and and um yeah i just hope that i was able to bring a few more of these kind of um, positive and hopeful stories and that, you know they weren't my stories what i tried to do but was really tell other people's stories they they were they were the ones who were telling the stories and i was just kind of their mouthpiece in the book and they they um had fantastic stories to tell about the important work that they were doing. And I just wanted to bring that to a wider audience. I, I definitely throughout the entire book got that message and read it. I, I that's why I want others to, to get out as well as that. There are some amazing human beings caring about some amazing species, plants and animals on this planet that are doing just fabulous fabulous work and uh we we need to support them we need to support australia in any way possible to make sure that we um protect this for the entire world that we get into a different operating system um for not only conservation but that we will have um places to live in multiple generations that are inhabitable and and beautiful for, for humanity as well as those other species and tree species and animal species. I have the hardest question for you today. It's really mm -hmm. the burning question. I ask all my guests this, it's WTF, the burning question. It's not the swear word, although maybe during this crazy time you, you have said it a few times, but it's what's the futures? What's the plan mm -hmm. out of all your academic and journeys and what you're reporting on? You have a, a plan for the future or do you know if there are some plans? What's the future? Where are we going? Where are we headed as humanity? I, I hope that, um, and, and I believe as well in, in the next five years there's going to be a real wake-up call about the impacts of climate change and that we have to act now and that we're rapidly running out of time and I think especially you know among younger people today there is no doubt that climate change is happening that we have to work very hard to um, 
reduce our greenhouse ga ga gas emissions, but more than that, really just transition to a greener future as rapidly as possible and to find the economic benefits of making that transition as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, we're going to start taking much harder and faster climate action and it's going to prevent a lot of the nightmare worst case scenarios that people are talking about at the moment and that's never going to become a world that we have to live in. This is a very similar question. It's probably not as hard, but what, what do you think or what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Um, I mean, I'd go back to this issue about a, a greener future. Really, it's a place where we're, we're not getting by on um, burning fossil fuels and coal and gas. And, you know, it's, it's um, we, all, all of the technologies already exist for us to um, live a much cleaner, much more uh, harmonious lifestyle with the, with the natural world, to have um, you know great green environments, um, you know running into our cities, and and um, you know that that's a much more pleasant world that we could all live in, where the, you know the air isn't choking with um, car fumes, and um, you know we're not still in, in Australia taking huge amounts of coal out of the ground. It's um, a, a rewilded world, a much greener and more rewilded world where we can all enjoy the benefits of nature. These last three questions are really for my listeners. And there, if there was one message you could impart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Um, similar to what I was saying before, you know, if um, if you worried about the environment, you're worried about the uh, future of the world, then vote with your feet and vote for politicians who are going to take strong action on climate change. What should young journalists uh, in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impact? Cover cover the important stories about climate change and kind of uh, and the environment and and um, you know like I try to do with the book find find a way to tell these stories in a you know bring important stories to light tell um, important stories about the work that people are doing around the environment in a kind of deeper way and bring bring stories that people don't know anything about to the attention of the public. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Um, I, I guess the importance of um, getting out onto the ground and into environments and experiencing things firsthand, you know, especially covering environmental stories, you know, with this book, I spent a lot of time going out with scientists, ecologists, um, Aboriginal rangers, uh, you know, traveling into the fire grounds and environments all over Australia. And, and um, it's that, that kind of experience and bringing environmental issues and environmental stories to light is um, invaluable. Yeah, it really helps you tell stories in a sort of more vivid and, and vital way. And um, yeah, it's just, that kind of on the ground experience is just really important in them um, getting kind of messages about the environment out. I, I have uh, had a lot of evolutionary biologists and uh, on the show and on the podcast and spoken to them and um, evolution takes hundreds of millions, billions uh, uh, of years. But there's another form of evolution. You kind of touched upon it right there in your last answer. And that's kind of the stories. It's the community. It's the culture. Um, that uh, cultural evolution is one that probably still takes a long time, but it's a little bit faster than normal evolution, where if we're reporting the right things, if we're writing the right stories, and Flames of Extinction to me is one that uh, we can get some strong uh learning lessons out of some strong stories out there to build a new culture on thinking for greener futures and uh, preparing for, for climate change that could set us on a much uh, 
more expedient evolution to a different type of a world, a, a one, one world without tons of loss and extinctions. And John, I really thank you for your time today and for letting us inside your ideas, inside your books. They're wonderful, not just uh, Flames of Extinction, but I would recommend your other books to them as well, to my listeners. And I thank you for your time uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you.